Good morning. The scripture text for the sermon today is from Jeremiah 29, 4 through 14. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be connected this morning. And if you're down in the lodge, good morning to you. And the Hope Kids Theater, good morning. Multi-purpose room, good morning. I had some fun this morning roaming around to these different spots a little bit. Didn't make it down to the lodge. But one of the things that's been so encouraging and a little bit surprising is that we have lots of people who are new to Hope who are joining us in our on-campus viewing experiences. So if you're new with us here on our campus this morning, or if you're new with us joining us on live stream, we're so glad you're with us and we're really, really happy to have you. So I'd like to ask you, if you will, to join me in a brief word of prayer as we get into the scripture this morning and continue on in our series called Homesick. Let's pray. Our Father God in heaven, we come to you today as people who feel varying degrees of homesickness, even when life feels, let's call it much more normal, even though the word normal doesn't have a normal anymore. Even when life is pretty normal, we have varying degrees of homesickness. We know that we are temporary residents here, but our citizenship is in heaven. And even when things are fairly normal, Lord, for many of us, there's just this sense that we miss you, we miss more, we miss heaven. And so, Lord, as we come to you now in these times that are magnified, that feel more exilic because of COVID, we bring our hearts to you, Lord. Would you meet with us? Would you speak to us? Would you draw our hearts to your heart? Would you create a place of union and connection and togetherness with you? That brings our hearts home. We ask you to do this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay, everybody. So I wonder if you've ever had a conversation with somebody. And while you're having the conversation, you're trying to express something that is really important to you. You have a lot of 
feeling with it. Not necessarily anger, but it's important to you. And it's a conversation where you really, really would like to connect with the person. The stakes feel high to you. So sometimes you have a conversation with somebody and and it seems that they're listening. They appear to be listening. And then something happens and you realize that they really weren't listening. A lot of times in a conversation, somebody might be listening for a moment and they might hear something that was what they were waiting for. I'll call it the trigger words. And once they get the trigger words, they've checked out to what you're continuing to say. And then they're on to in their head what they want to say, no longer listening to what you want to say. And so they heard the trigger words early on in the conversation, but they were no longer listening as you were trying to explain and bring your heart out into the conversation. Sometimes conversations go like that. You're trying to explain or share something that's important to you. The other person seems to be listening, but somehow a little bit later on you realize that that they weren't really listening. Or you have a conversation and it seemed that you were connecting and that people were listening and our hearts were in this but we don't see any results of the conversation. We don't see any response. We don't see any change in behavior. And somehow there's this missing that's happening. The conversation where we hope to bring our hearts together and it seemed that perhaps it was an earnest connection, but we just feel later on that there wasn't a listening, there wasn't an engagement in it. You can feel sort of disregarded You can feel that your emotional investment and all that you were feeling wasn't really taken seriously or taken to heart. I can't help but wonder if that's the way God feels when he's speaking to us through the prophets. I can't help but wonder if that's the way Jeremiah, the prophet we're speaking from, feels an earnest effort to communicate, to bring our hearts together. Maybe the appearance that we're listening But then later on, it somehow becomes clear that there wasn't any real listening. So if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, you know that we're in this series moving through the book of Jeremiah. And we're presenting it almost like a broad drama. Scene one, you may remember a few weeks ago, we called the heartache. Scene two was the glossing over of the real issue. Scene three last week was the the heart, the core of the matter. Scene four this week, we're talking about a hopeful future. Scene five next week, we'll talk about new hearts. The reason we're doing this is because in many ways, when you have a rich, important, deep relationship that's got hardship in it, so often that's the way a conversation goes. It starts by expressing the heartache and then the glossing over. No, we're not going to obfuscate the real issue. Then finally, we get to the real issue. And once we do, now we can begin to talk about a fresh and hopeful future with new hearts. It's kind of the arc of Jeremiah and what he's talking to us about. So the people of Israel are in exile. They're in Babylon. They've been removed from Jerusalem and from their homelands in Judah, and they're in Babylon, a foreign place. It's not where they want to be. It's not where their worship and their lives and their relationships have a root system of death with God. They've been taken away from the familiar. They've been taken away from life as they know it, life as they want it. It's a kind of uprooted upheaval. They're away from what's stable, what's familiar. Life has a host of times that feel exilic. Times where we experience grief, profound loss, feels like times of exile. We just feel that we've been uprooted, there's an upheaval, and we feel drifting. Times where perhaps we have a profound and difficult battle with a medical diagnosis, maybe a cancer challenge, another really serious illness, can feel like exile a time where we feel uprooted, a time of upheaval. Maybe a time when a marriage relationship that has so much heart investment feels like it's not going well at all and maybe is distancing to the degree that it may not work. It feels like exile. It feels like a time that's uprooted with upheaval. And of course, stating the obvious, it feels like all of us to a certain degree 
are living in the exilic experience of COVID, where we're uprooted, where we have upheaval, where everything is different. Particularly now at the beginning of the school year where so many families are experiencing these incredible challenges of how to juggle everything and how to do school and adjust in mid-course, all kinds of stuff like this. In many respects, it feels like exile. You know what's amazing about this section in Jeremiah 29? It's what God says to his people who are in exile. But before we get into talking about what God says to his people who are in exile, I think we have to go back to something really basic and say, who is God? Who's God to us? Who's God to you? We might say, come on, I mean, that's so basic, so obvious. Really, we're going to go back to that? I don't know that it is as basic or as obvious as we think, and here's why. I think for many of us, God is an idea, Even maybe for many of us who have been in church for a long, long time, for many of us, God is an idea, some kind of abstraction, but not really personal, not really a God of love, not really a God who has a beating heart that loves us so passionately and intimately. For some people who have a very intellectual version of their faith, I wonder if the metaphor strikes that effectively God is a library, God has a whole bunch of big books and concepts and abstractions and philosophical notions, and God is a library. For some of us, it's understandable that if our church has a building that we associate with the place where we go week after week, then it's almost difficult to make a distinction between God and the building. It's as though God is the building. If you've ever been in Jerusalem If you stand by the western wall of the old city of Jerusalem and you see people praying, 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 pressing their heads against those stones, it almost feels that God is a wall. So who's God? Is God an idea for you? Is God a library? Is God a building? Is God a wall? Is God a mountain? Start filling in your list. The prophets want us to know that God is a personal, living being who is sovereign, beautiful, holy, and the lover of our souls. And this is this great gap that the prophets are trying to get our attention to. Like, please know he's not an idea. He's not a philosophy. He's not a library. He's not a wall. He's a living, loving God who deeply, deeply desires this intimate relationship with us. But it's so hard for us to find our way there, to find our way to know that God is a personal, holy, glorious lover. And that's what the prophets are so wanting us to know. So what does God say to the exiles? What advice does he have for exiles? For the times in our life that feel like exile, for the COVID season, or for true exile. What does God say to the exiles? It's breathtaking what he says. He says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens, eat what they produce. Marry, have sons and daughters. Pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city. You know what's amazing about this section of scripture? Jeremiah is saying, when you are in exile, move in. Move into it. What are you talking about move into it? Everything about exile is completely undesirable. We're trying to move out of it and get out of it as fast as we can. That's the natural human response. That's the natural human response, but apparently the supernatural God-given direction is not spend all your time lamenting that that it's the way it is. Not spend all your time trying to wish it away and get out of it. Remarkably, God is telling his people while they're in exile in Babylon, move into it, invest in it. In other words, buy the house. In other words, plant the gardens. Otherwise, these are gonna be wasted experiences and wasted years. And one thing that we know of God is that he desires that we don't waste one ounce of the richness of life's experiences because every one of them, as you've heard me say repeatedly, is an invitation to come closer to him. Yeah, but we're human beings. When it's really hard, we don't want it that way. We want out. And breathtakingly, God is saying, in the midst of this hard, I'm telling you, move in. I have a memory When I was in my 20s and early 30s, I have an older sister who is about six years older than I am. She got married in her late 30s, 
And I do remember she would have been happy to be married, but the right situation didn't come along. The right person, the right circumstances didn't develop when she was in her 20s and early 30s. And I distinctly remember her saying one time, I am going to completely invest in my life right now as a single woman. I'm not going to live my life like I'm waiting around for life to happen. I am moving into the life that I have right now, like buy the house, invest in the career, move into the life that God has before us right now. I remember it. I thought, wow, that's a remarkable viewpoint. She did that. A few years later, she met somebody terrific and they got married. But I remember her thinking, I'm moving into it. I'm not going to just sit around and wait as though life is passing me by. I remember it so well. That's called moving into it. Moving into the experiences with the God who gives life. In other words, God's saying, when you're in exile, move in. When you're in exile, seek me. When you're in exile, come close to me. Remember, exile Places where we're uprooted, where we experience upheaval or confusion, where we're away from the stabilities that hold us in life. Maybe you've moved recently and you've left a familiar long-standing place. Maybe you've lost someone you love dearly and the exile still remains. And God is saying, move in. But ultimately, he's not saying, move in to that place. You know what he's saying. He's saying, move in to me. Move in to me. No matter the circumstances of life. Because you know what's hard to do? It's really hard to live life going up and down and up and down and up and down, trying to figure out if God loves me or not, loves me or not, is he good or not, is he for me or not, is he against me or not. That's an exhausting way to live life. And through this journey through Jeremiah, we've been saying one thing that is clearly established is that he loves us. This is not in question. And now we're going to get to the meat of today's section, which is he is for us. This is not in question. Your circumstances have nothing to do with whether God is for you or not. He is for you. And that's why he says, whatever the circumstances, move in. Move into me because I'm the one who has life in me. Your circumstances are the place you're looking for life, but your circumstances don't give you life. I give you life. Move into me regardless of your circumstances because I'm the one who has life. Okay, so let's back up for a moment and think about what Jeremiah was speaking to the people about. He's calling them to repent and come to God's grace for forgiveness, to come into a restored relationship. Isaiah, the prophet, said it this way. He said to the people, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll become like wool. In other words, God is calling his people to reason with the reality of the condition of their hearts and receive his grace. But later on in Isaiah, we hear it this way. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But here's the kicker. But you would have none of it. In other words, in Isaiah 1, he says, move into me and receive my grace. But in Isaiah 30, the people are moving into themselves. You would have none of it. You wouldn't have anything of coming to me and receiving my love and grace. You turned into yourselves and you would have none of that grace. And here is that up and down and up and down challenge. It's an exhausting way to live life constantly trying to interpret God through our circumstances. God is for us, regardless of our circumstances. That is one of the great steps of faith as we pursue this life with him that he's inviting us to. All right, and then where do we go next? We go into this very famous section of scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. And God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The Hebrew says something like, I know the intentions that I have. I know the thoughts that I have for you. They are thoughts for a beautiful future. You know what's interesting in American ears when we hear that? 
I think we hear it, and when it says, I know the plans I have for you, we think it means plans for greatness, plans that my life is going to be victorious and great. And so we read Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. This is on fridge magnets and bumper stickers. Our interpretation, even though the words say something different, the way we interpret it is, I know the plans I have for you, plans to make you great. But that's not what it says. It says, my plans are for your goodness, for your peace. In other words, as God goes on to tell us about these plans, we stopped listening here. We got to verse 11, and these were the trigger words for us, and we stopped listening to what comes next. So we hear the prophet say, I know the plans I have for you. Yeah, plans for me, for greatness for me. And we stop there. We're not listening to what he says next. In other words, in this section coming, verse 11 is our favorite. Plans for greatness, we think, is what it says. Plans to make me famous is what we think it says. It's not what it says. But we stop listening there. No, what God is going to say in verse 12 is, then you'll call on me and pray to me and I'll listen to you. Do you see the coming together intimacy of it? And then in verse 13, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Do you see the closer closerness of how God sees it? When God says, I know the plans I have for you, in our American mind, we think, yeah, plans for greatness. No, actually what God is saying is, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for intimacy with me. Those are the plans that I have for you. There's a guy who lived in the 1600s. He was known to go by the name Brother Lawrence. He was a monk in France. He wrote a book called The Practice of the Presence of God, Margaret Scholl writes this. She says, fulfilling one's potential has little to do with greatness. Let's add, what, Margaret? Are you out of your mind? We're Americans. Okay, back to Margaret. Fulfilling one's potential has little to do with greatness. And yet the heroism of the ordinary does not preempt greatness that our world confers to those who have reached their potential with staggering and dramatic achievement. For even those who achieve greatness have faced the doldrums of routine and tedium. But to assign the fulfillment of one's potential solely to great acts and recognition is to miss the blessing that comes from faithful acts of devotion, often done routinely and heroically in the ordinary of our every day. Perhaps it might be said of us as it was of Brother Lawrence, He was more united with God in his ordinary activities. Let me say it another way. When God says, I know the plans I have for you, his plan for us is us with him. In other words, if I'm God speaking, it's God saying, I know the plans I have for you. My plans are us together. But we stopped listening after verse 11 because we thought, I know the plans I have for you, plans to make you famous and great, and we didn't pay attention to what came next. We hear it and we say, I know the plans you have for me, and that plan is for me. And God is saying, I know the plans I have for you, and that plan is us together. So we're living in strange times, hard times, There is no doubt that a less interested population in God is a mounting presence in the world and in our country. Justin Camp says, for all the supposed we don't need God, figure it out ourselves ability that our modern culture claims, shouldn't things be getting better for us? That was the promise. But since the 1960s, we've become more anxious and depressed, lonelier, less connected, more medicated, more obese, and more willing to end our own lives. Despite wondrous breakthroughs in science and technology, many of the trend lines that plot how we're doing as a people are getting scarier. So he goes on and he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Do you see how God's vision of this whole thing is this intimate union with him? 
We stop at verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, plans for a hope and a future. I think that's our favorite part because it feels like it's all about us. I think God's favorite part is verses 12 and 13 where we're united with him in such a rich intimacy. To us, his plans are about me. To God, his plans are about us together. You know that living a life of faith is a different way to live a human life. To live a life where we say we are trusting in a God who is invisible, who is real, who is absolutely true, but is nonetheless invisible. To live a life and say that we are going to trust in a God who is invisible is a different way to live a human life. The empiricism of our day rejects it. God and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself are speaking into our world to call us to embrace it. That this is the way to live the most meaningful, most full, most rich human experience. Hardships, of course, challenge our control. They challenge our sense of God's plans. When things are really hard, we wonder, is there a God? Is he good? Maybe he's lost control of things. In other words, we are interpreting the entirety of it all based on our circumstances. We've talked about this in the past. So God has a plan for us. I think it could be a reasonable thing to think about this by thinking about a path for us. I know a path that I have for you, says the Lord. I was reading about this a little bit this week, and I learned this term. I'd never known it. Maybe you already know it. I'd never known it. The term blaze, like to blaze a path or to blaze a trail. Historically, a blaze was a chop in a tree that marked a trail. So in Richmond, we're quite familiar with a road in our part of the city called Three Chopped Road. Three Chopped Road apparently followed an old Indian trail that was marked with three hatchet chops in a tree. So if you look at this picture, you get a little sense of an idea of the three chops in the tree. Let's hold the picture for a moment because God has a plan for us, a path for us. He blazes a trail for us. What he does not do is show us the entire journey on the GPS and that's the part we don't like. We want the GPS with the alternate routes made available, with the amount of travel time and the places where we can stop. But we don't get that full journey with God. And why is that? I suspect it's because if he showed us that whole picture, we would say to him, thanks, see you later, I'm doing it myself. But if we have a God who deeply desires intimate relationship with us, you know what I think he does? I think he shows us just far enough to the next tree with the marks on it. I think he shows us just far enough so we trust him for the next tree with the next marks on it. And why is that the case? Because we have to stay close to him in order to be walking tree by tree. And then when we get to that tree, we see the next one. The three marks on the tree in Richmond in our part of town, which is called Three Chop Road, I'm going to propose an idea that we call it the Trinity Trail. And the Trinity Trail is where God is inviting us with plans that he has for us. Show us the whole thing. He doesn't show us the whole thing. He shows us the next tree. And why does he do that? So we'll stay so close to him. And why would he do that? Is he tormenting us? By no means. He's doing it because he loves us so much that he wants us to trust him as we keep moving along on this road. But times that are really hard, they challenge our sense of control more than any other time in life. COVID challenges our sense of control. It either unhinges us or fastens us much more deeply to this God who is just showing us the next mark on the tree. We have a nephew who's battling a serious form of leukemia. He's doing it with awesome, facing this situation with remarkable faith and beauty, he and his young wife. His mom is my wife's twin sister. His dad and I were close friends in college. We ended up marrying twin sisters. We were texting yesterday about the journey that they're on as he's seeking treatment. We don't get to see the entire journey. We all are taking this one step at a time as we move together as a family, praying and encouraging one another. 
We were texting yesterday, and in our text thread, this to a friend who is a very close friend in college and all the way through, I said, it takes us back to some of the basics, kind of like the less experienced trust in God we had when we were in college. Now we have much more experience, and we're back to that core trust each step to the next mark on the tree that the Spirit is marking for us to keep on the path. He goes before us and he keeps giving us a next mark. We would like the entire GPS map of the journey planned and laid out for us. He just gives us the next mark on the tree. One big reason, I suspect, is that he loves us so much that he longs for us to stay near him on the journey, which we are more pressed to do when we can only see the next mark on the tree, not see the whole trip. The prophets are calling our hearts home to this intimate place. So I want to close by an invitation about what might it mean to seek God with our whole heart. He says, if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. I'm going to invite you to an exercise for the month of September. If you're in a place where you're thinking, I need and want more of God, I need and want to know him more, to see him more, to understand him more, to feel him more, I'll encourage you to a deep seeking of God experience through the month of September. You're going to need a journal. In the morning, I want to encourage you to write one very thoughtful sentence that is a prayer of seeking God. And in the evening, I want you to come back to your journal and I want you to review in the evening what you've seen and experienced that day. When you get to September 30th, I have a feeling reading through this journal would be a beautiful mark of the marks on the trail with the God who says, when you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Let's pray together. Our our Lord God Almighty, We know that you invite us to faith and it's hard for us to do. We know that you invite us to trust you and it's hard for us to do. We know that you love us and for some of us, it's hard for us to trust. We know that you are for us and for some of us, it's hard for us to trust. So Lord, would you help us somehow have the voice of the prophet slip in between the seams of our heart to release us from ourselves into the freedom and the life that you're inviting us to. You've told us, choose life. The Lord your God is your life. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.